Well, a, a boy's best friend is his mother. Kill her, mommy. Kill her. We'll tear your soul apart. Live or die. I'm not even gonna swat that fly. I hope they are watching. They'll see. They'll see and they'll know. And they'll say, well, she wouldn't even have a fly. This six year old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face. The blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and when he never said him, tried to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was truly and simply evil. A haunted ship. I'm getting some really strange readings in here. A missing crew. This place is a tomb. DJ, where are you? An infinite evil. This ship has been beyond the boundaries of our universe. Who knows what it's brought back with it? Vacate! No! I want off this ship. You can't leave. She won't let you. Event Horizon. Rated R. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Back in the Blockbuster with your hosts, Gaius and Jackson. We've got a little leftover Tales of Horror episode for you guys today, coming at you with Event Horizon from 1997. And uh, cheers, Gaius, thanks to you for uh, working around my schedule to get this one in, because I really wanted to watch this movie again for spooky season. And, you know, of course, schedules are all over the place for me lately, for both of us. You're shouldering yeah. a lot of work, but... Uh, who cares? It's November. Really wanted to talk this movie, so really glad that we get the chance to do that today. So yes, looking forward to today's chat. Yep, looking forward to it as well. Uh, someone mentioned uh, when they saw the Descent episode drop, and I think I, I labeled it as like a bonus uh, Tales of Horror episode, and that there would probably be one more. And uh, they were like, well, you know, man, like, what can you really talk about in the early parts of November? There aren't any like big like Thanksgiving movies. Like, There's some, but like not enough to like, you know, really take up a whole month um yeah and you know at least it's at the first half of the november so it's good november's I mean, I, I, even more of a vacuum for me because we don't have thanksgiving this month in canada so it's oh like yeah you're in october for you guys right yeah exactly it's yeah. weeks past so it's not even anything i think about like i don't think of any movies when i think of november so i know what you're saying yeah, yeah. and um and i'll talk about horror movies no matter what time of the month it is so it, it's, it exactly, doesn't really matter yeah uh, and I think anyone listening doesn't really matter that it's like, hey, you know, it's we were recording this on November twelfth. They're not gonna be like, oh, it's the twelfth of November. Like, move mm -hmm. on. No one's gonna say that. We're good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, this movie works any month of the year. Yeah, it does. And um, it's you know, I saw this. Did not see this in theaters. This I can finally say that. You I was waiting say. for you to tell me that you did. I, I meant yeah. to set that up, so that's surprising. When did you see yeah. this for the first time? Yeah, usually I say when we do these, like I saw this in theaters because like yeah. you know. Tell me about the awesome magic. theatrical experience. <laughs> he's like, he's like, Ugh, always. Uh, but no, I saw this late. Um, I think I avoided it for a while because I knew um, who directed it, which is always fun when people <laughs> think that this is, people think this is like the other Paul Anderson, the one that makes like auteur movies, <laughs> and not Paul W. S. Anderson, who did Mortal Kombat right. and Resident Evil. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, it's, I mean, I, of course, I saw Mortal Kombat when that came out, and you know. For a long time, that was considered one of the best video game movies at that time, and it was a really low bar. So I mean, like, because the video game movies were not that great, but yeah. Mortal Kombat was, you know, even though it was PG thirteen and not as violent as the games, it was still relatively well done for what it was supposed to be. So I remember his name from that, but like, uh, right? I, but Event Horizon, like, growing up from what I can remember, wasn't I didn't remember seeing previews for it growing up or trailers for it growing up. So it was kind of a I, cult hit. 
wasn't hit DVDs anyway, right? Yeah. It wasn't huge at the box office. It it got shit on by critics. I think the the scores yeah. still are pretty down there for this yeah, movie. I, so I don't blame the, you. I believe the Rotten Tomatoes score is thirty four percent. So that's still not, at thirty four. Yeah, thirty five meta score. Yeah, it's um, not, but the movie has aged really well. I think. So I think I saw this for the first time. I want to say two thousand nine. So that'd be like fifteen years ago. So I waited a long time, but I knew about it from people who did see it because like. You go on like certain websites and be are certain people would talk about like, hey, this movie did really really bad when it came out, but I, I swear it like it's really really good. I have friends that even said that it scared the shit out of them, that kind of thing. You know, kind of hyped it up. So I was like, all right, maybe I should see it. But I still waited a really long time because like I don't know if it's gonna be my thing or not. And then I finally did see it, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, the atmosphere of it, and mm. I love how it, it escalates into what it feels like a nightmare by the end of it, um, a full on like nightmare by the end of it. Yeah. Um, but I uh, and I think I saw it one more other time a few years later, and I didn't pay attention to this the first time I watched it, but I did the second time, and I did for th- this watch is that it is still uh executed well, and I liked it for the most part. But knowing what I know about how rushed it was, you can get that mm. sense of like, especially the editing of the movie a little bit. You I do felt get a that sense of like, too. it gets it jumps around a bit. Uh, at certain parts, and I was like, oh, wow, maybe that is where the problems were. You can tell that there are certain scenes that don't flow like well from one scene to the next, where it seems like there feels a bit more like of a time jump in the cut, and I know that's not what the, what they're trying to do. It just feels like, you know, that's where you can tell where aspects were missed or rushed uh, to get it done, because uh, apparently this one was not, I mean, during its production was rushed, and then during post-production was rushed, and um, and then it was also supposed to be a longer cut, and there's a lot that yes. we were, we're, we are missing out on because that stuff is all destroyed, right? It's all all those. This, this is really what I wanted footage. to spend some time on in this episode is like yeah. the pr- production and post production, like what this movie like almost was and could have been if not for you know studio mandates and stuff. Because that is like my yeah. favorite part about when I think back to this film and the copy of it that exists out there that we'll likely never see is like. I didn't realize that the first time I watched this movie. And then I think I just, I watched like, you know, as I do with most movies I see for the first time, I just go on YouTube and see what other creators yeah. break down the production of it. And like, there's some really cool history to this movie um, that like adds to that watch. Cause I feel you like the first, the most, this time more than the other two times I watched it. Did you, did I catch that right? Was this your third watch or had you seen it'll it? It'll be a thir- third one. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the, Mine too, but in a much shorter time period, I think I only saw this movie here you are saying you watched this in 2009. I'm like, how do you remember what? Like, how can you pinpoint that? I know. I like, that's a really, like, really weird, like, memory when it yeah. comes to, like, doing so, I'm like that with like some that. movies, for sure. <laughs> that, yeah. yeah. But when this came out in 97, I'm like, that is crazy. Because I, yeah. I watched this for the first time. I can't even remember if it was three or four years ago. Because it was that recent. But I, this is my third watch of it. Because I think last year or the year before I got that desire, I, I was, like, kind of fresh on the first watch. And I wanted to get that rewatch in. And Yeah. It was pretty solid and this time i kind of like you were mentioning i kind of noticed more some technical stuff and started just a- criticizing it a little bit more but once we get in and once you know like just what paul ws anderson was up against when he made this movie it's hard to hold it against him for the challenges yeah. that this movie like brought him because like you said like this movie i think they had a 10 months to film it to shoot it yeah. and four weeks to edit and post and like that is and you and normally like get that, ten. Yeah, that's what they were saying. Like they usually want a ten week window to uh, for the editing. Pretty process. hard and to think, do that. And I think he agreed to a six week uh, editing schedule. And then I guess with uh, Paramount uh, was dealing with Titanic, and, they, and that was supposed to open in September, and they realized that that wasn't going to happen because uh, Titanic ended up coming out in December of ninety seven. So like they were, it was like it was. Uh, they were like, okay, well, we need to get this out because we need something on the schedule. And I, exactly. I forgot that like studios do that when. They have a whole if they if they have to move something around or like anything like that happens i forget that most studios want to fill that hole in with another one of their movies if they can mm-hmm. and this was the one that they chose to do it with because it was you know already in production and they were just like hey like get this done faster so then the editing process turned into four weeks and said oh, and, and he agreed to six and that that even was you know short uh and you know i mean what for considering how rushed it was and all those problems i mean when i watched it for this i did want to pay attention to like i wonder if it feels like it and yeah there are editing jumps that feel like oh feel like there's missing moments here that 
maybe Definitely. fill in some of these little gaps. But considering all the issues that they had with it, I think it still turned out pretty good. And, it's still uh, very enjoyable to watch if you're just if you're not trying to look for all these things. It is a great right. sci-fi horror set in space. Right. And you know how like you hear horror stories about like trouble production, you know, history and like troubled post-production history. And like the movie can really be like a dumpster fire by the time you watch it. It's just yeah. like, oh, this is not like this was this doesn't even feel like anything that's cohesive at all. But I thought it is for the most part and so enjoyable. And I, I love the atmosphere of it. There's some pretty there. I forgot, I always forget how that like, there's some imagery in this movie that's like uh, like pretty stays with you and it gets particularly yeah. like I mean, I would I know I know they want I think the studio was pretty mad during one of the cuts that the movie was so gory at one point. Um it's not especially I mean, I guess because I'm like so used to watching movies that are kind of gory, like there is gore in it towards like the end section of the movie where a lot of stuff starts to get really crazy. Um right. but it's not like nothing that will like turn your stomach completely, but there's definitely some stuff in there. I was like, whoa, like it stays with you um, a bit. Um, yeah. But yeah. You see yeah, the uh, formula of that NC-17 rating that was there that he had to cut down and he leaves yeah. just enough in it. I think the final, like the uh, amount is like 15 seconds of like the like big scenes that he'd had that he'd yeah. shown in the first cut that yeah. Paramount made him cut down. And you get 15 minutes of like, the like hell dimension super messed up gory imagery imagery so which is really effective when it's shown in the movie but it's like oh to know that there's like literally like tens of minutes of footage out there and like the lengths he went to like what he did to film that stuff and it's literally just in a vault somewhere like <sighs> improperly filed and we're never going to get that director's cut is like i think one of cinema's like or one of horror cinema's like great tragedies and by the way, Paramount uh, has a, a little bit of a history with doing this uh, for fans that liked uh, that, you know, some of the Friday 13 movies towards the end there are more like horror culty kind of favorites for fans. Like once you get to the seventh one, they're not good anymore. <laughs> they're just kind of fun. But Friday 13 part seven, uh, the new blood is a heavily cut down uh, Friday 13 movie as far as gore. And the director of that movie has always wanted to, you know, he explored you know, storing that or finding a way to like make it the way that he wanted to make it and save situation, follow the way wrong. Something that is just gone. That footage is like destroyed yeah. and shame can never uh, get it back. So they're, they've done this before. I don't know how you like that happens. Like you just like, I mean, I feel like you should hold on to that footage no matter what. I don't know how it gets like lost or destroyed. Um, I know there was some like yeah. interview when I read that or that was re when I was researching it. I think it was in 20. 11 or 2012 where they, they said someone had found like a VHS tape of like that footage and then he said he was going to like check it out and see if it could be used and then in another future interview they brought that story up to him and maybe it he thought it existed and it turns out it didn't or maybe like the, the VHS that even what they could have done wouldn't look good if they did try to restore it but he yeah, said he basically like, it's gone forever like there's nothing we can do about it um and I, that has to be so disappointing as a filmmaker to you to like to know like what it could have been, um, but I mean, yeah, but especially now, for know, him, it, yeah. And when there's an appetite for that, like I can't remember the name of this company, but there's this one. It's not like Criterion or anything, but there's a you might know it. There's a company out there that like literally like splices together like makes uh, special editions of movies and stuff, and they were interested in putting out a director's cut of. Uh, that horizon and they waited years and years before they released it like for that extra footage to right. surface so that they could make it the way they wanted to and it just it's never come about and this is a shame when like there's people out there that want to do it and just for context like it's not a matter of like a few minutes of or maybe a couple extra scenes apparently the original cut was 130 minutes and that's the one that he shown that paul ws anderson screened i guess quite disastrously while he was yeah. still ed editing the movie and the final cut ends up being 90 minutes so that's like that's a pretty considerable chunk of footage it's a lot of movie that, gone that's <laughs> yeah, a lot of movie yeah yeah way too much and uh and it's interesting too because uh, i don't i don't know if you hear, you hear that a lot too where like a studio will screen the movie and it's like oh this is not working i wonder why i mean i know they had complaints about the gore and stuff like that and i know a lot of studios when a movie is too long they do want you to cut it down a lot um, sure. Yeah. And but you know the amount of pressure that he must have been, and like you know, at the position that he was in too, because I I read that after he did Mortal Kombat and that was a hit, that he had the option to do um, 
kind of whatever he wanted. And one of those things was uh, the option was to do Mortal Kombat Annihilation, which was the sequel to that, and that turned out horrible. I don't know if it would have turned out better with him, but it turned okay, out. Okay, he didn't bad. direct it. Okay. <laughs> no, uh, and then the other option was to do X Men before Brian Singer got it, and uh, and he ended up wanting to do what was pitched to him like an R rated horror movie. He didn't want to do a PG thirteen movie again as for Mortal Kombat, at least not right away. And you know, to kind of he has when well, you have a hit, you do have the pick of what you want. Yeah. Uh, sometimes. And I kind of see that kind of uh, turn into what it did turn to. I mean, I'm sure like he likes that the movie is respected and regarded in a way that it wasn't in '97, like you know today. And he probably can like look at that with a bit of validation, like, hey, well, these people found something to enjoy about it, even though you know his full vision of it is will never mm. seen by everyone. But that has to be uh, a hard thing to experience. And then like, because you know you're not, you're not thinking in 1997 when this comes out, it. <laughs> bombs it's 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 a critical failure you're not thinking yeah. like well you know 15 years from now like they'll understand it <laughs> like, like, you know, kurt, russell that, knew really. this, kurt russell told oh yeah him, yeah you know that story yeah that that yeah it's pretty like but yeah, I want, yeah you can tell it too though if you want that about like, i don't know exactly like verbatim what he said but basically kurt russell saw this movie like knew that paul ws anderson was like bummed about how it turned out and he said like you know, don't worry about this now. In 15 years from now, this movie is going to be a cult classic and they'll appreciate what you made or something along those lines, um, which is just so random and cool that he saw the potential of this movie. Yeah. I mean, that's cool, though. I mean, he, I mean, he had another thing or two about like a movie flopping and then turning into yeah. a cult hit. You know, I mean, you got the, th- the thing the was thing? Like, probably, yeah. yeah, as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's a good person to like give you that kind of outlook on it. And he was but, totally right, too. Yeah. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, uh, the movie was real, written by Philip Eisner, and we obviously directed by Paul W. S. Anderson. Stars Lawrence Fishburne, Sam Neill, Kathleen Quinlan, and Jolie Richardson. Uh, Richard T. Jones is in this. Too. I always forget that he's in it. Uh, he's Cooper in the movie. And he's always popping up in like random movies and TV shows. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, I don't like, recognize him from anything else. <laughs> he's mostly TV now, but like he, uh, he okay. pops up oh, a lot. Of yeah, he uh, pops up in a few things. Uh, one of those like kind of like reliable like. Not a list, but like you know, in a lot of things and recognized right, by a lot right. of people. Um, it's set in 2047. It follows a crew of astronauts sent on a rescue mission after a missing spaceship. The Event Horizon spontaneously appears in orbit around Neptune, only to discover that a sensory force has come back with it. Like we said, it had a trouble production. Uh, Paramount, uh, they wanted it rushed when it became clear that Titanic would not meet its projected release. Like you said, the original cut was 130 minutes of the, and it was heavily edited by the studio, for, by the studio's demand. Uh, to Anderson's uh, disapproval. Uh, it was a commercial and critical failure, grossing $42 million worldwide on a $60 million budget. But it uh, became, it sold well on home video and DVD. And uh, it sold that well that Paramount t- contacted Anderson to begin working on the restoration of the deleted footage. But he said, it's gone. Right. Um, I would have loved to kind of been Paramount when like those sales were coming in and they were like, whoa, what's going on here? And like see what they can kind of do with the movie now. Cause I'm pretty sure the movie bombed, they were like, whatever. It's we, right. Now I'm lost. Um, but yeah, it has uh, developed a pretty big cult following and um, it's referenced in other works of pop culture. That, and it's also referenced in the fact that it, it feels heavily influenced by other. Um, yes. Sci-fi movies. Was waiting to get to here. Yeah. Um, you know, I I do see the influences. I I do like um, when I was watching it. I, I I do love that this is not just like some you know alien and uh, like terror kind of space kind of movie. And it's more right. Uh, it's like different now. A bit more cerebral. A bit more like it almost feels like a haunted house uh, thing in but in space. Uh, right. And- Which is honestly how Alien was described to me the first time I saw it, and I've heard it described that way. And it undeniably alien influenced, but not yeah. ripped off. Yeah, exactly. And rides on uh, line really well. And I love that it, I mean, I mean, probably because of all the cuts, it feels like it does. I wouldn't call it a slow burn, but it takes its time a little bit in the beginning, I guess, before yep. things uh, get out of hand. And then at that point, it's just like, it's just like you're just watching like several just nightmarish scenes and images. And, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I can put myself in the position of like, it would be so weird to be on in a position where, your greatest fears are being projected out to you and like, you're just seeing things and like, you know, and of course you're with the group and like, they don't know if like, Hey, what you're seeing is real. And then the group's turning against each other at certain stages, because you know, that's what would happen that you're in a a predicament where you are isolated. And and that's what I think about space in general, like terrifies me. I never want to explore it ever. It's like, there's that vastness of it that it's just like, that would be, it would be so terrifying to be lost in that. 
and, and right. you know, and so it has that going forward to you. But um, yeah, I, I love that it's not like what you typically would expect. It is influenced by you know aliens stuff like that. But I like I like that it kind of goes in a different direction than what most kind of uh, you know terror and horror that kind mm-hmm. of space movies would normally do. So totally, um, I'd be remiss not to mention. So in my notes here, I thought I left them at home, but I do still have them here in my dorm room. But um, when I had written down is like, obviously this is very alien inspired, like we mentioned, but also gives me such Hellraiser vibes. Do you get any of that when you're watching this? Yeah, but in the hell dimension, like sequences that we get of all these like mutilated bodies doing horrific things to each other, like, you know, very characteristic of the Hellraiser series, but even like the, the core in this movie, which is like what powers the event horizon with the ship and ends up yeah. being this catalyst that transports it to this chaos realm. Uh, looks very much like influenced by Clive Barker. I think it'd be something that he'd be proud of. And it looks like the puzzle box from Hellraiser in its design. And so I always think yeah. of that when I'm watching this movie is Hellraiser meets Alien. And I think there's a lot of the shining in here too. Like more like like uh, nods to it, not so much inspired by it, but well, a little bit yeah. actually. Where the yeah, environment like, you're in makes you crazy and lose your mind a bit, yeah, yeah. But there's some very, very obvious homages to The Shining in here too. Yeah, and um, were there any scenes that in particular that stood out to you as like? Because I remember when I first saw it, because like the people I, I I knew people that did see it, and you know sometimes you got to be careful when your friends say like, oh, it's so scary. It's like one of the scariest things I've ever seen. Uh, and, it doesn't mean anything I, anymore. I know, and then I do see this movie on the list of like you know scariest like kind of sci-fi horror movies, and uh, so I I don't think that per se, um, but Me neither. I, but I, I do think there's some scenes that stand out as being like well done and well executed. I was wondering if you had any that you like enjoyed or like. Yeah, like one of my favorites, of course, like the 15 seconds of footage we see from like the previous crew that our characters are there to like rescue like when we see like their final log and it's just like this insane orgy of like fleshless bodies screaming like that is an awesome sequence it's hard to call it a scene it's more of like a sequence but i love that um most like the other scenes that i love in this movie are more like shots like that shot of Lawrence fishburne's character the the person he's hallucinating that is like his biggest fear and his biggest regret like yeah whoever that character was that died died of the fire like coming yeah, when he's like rising out of the water on fire, that is such an awesome shot. I love yeah. that so much. And I have one written down too that I really oh, the sequence when, and again, I know we're both like a week or two off this watch, so not everything is yeah. as fresh in my brain. But from my notes in here, there's a shot. I can't remember who. It's one of the female characters. I don't know if it's Peters or Stark, but when they are combing through, it's like very soon after they first get onto the event horizon from the Lewis and Clark, and they're kind of roaming around. Just like discovering what's left over from the ship and the crew and they're going through the dark corridors. There's a great shot of someone entering a room. I think it ends up being like a medical bay and I don't know what it is. I know it's not lightning, but something illuminates the wall like in light yeah. and you see just like this gory mess of flesh all on the wall. Like, the I think wall you see yeah. like a face and that shot in set design is really, really great. It's always been a standout when watching yeah. this movie. And then of course the big, shining homage with like the the gravity tank spilling out the blood all over oh, yeah. Stark and knocks her off her feet it's like so clearly like you know yeah referencing stanley that. kubrick yeah yeah, yeah yeah so love that shot too but uh yeah what about yourself um the, the sequence with uh justin when he tries to kill himself as he's going oh, he's yeah. being that scene uh is really well done i so like Great i will tension. say some that some of the dialogue in the movie is a little clunky like it's just like very like oh uh not, I mean, whatever. I mean, it's a sci-fi horror movie. I have to yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's the fault. But there was some stuff that he's saying in that scene that I was like, oh, that's so cheesy, a little heavy-handed. But <laughs> yeah. the, just the uh, the escalating tension of it is really good. And like, you know, like, oh, are they going to get to him in time? That kind of uh, thing. Right. And then him gradually just losing it. Like, when you see his arms, like, kind of, it's like, it's like his veins are, like, popping up. And then, like... And he snaps and then, back <laughs> into reality. He goes, what's going on? He, he's like, how did I yeah. get in here? I love that. Yeah. Yeah, and then when he's like, he's, I mean, he's like saying like my eyes, my eyes, I can feel my eyes, and he, Lawrence Fisher is telling him just to close his eyes and like get like in a ball basically, and like, but then like he's like, there's that one shot where he's like shaking his head, and you can just see like blood like flowing out uh, of his face, and you, and you know where it's coming from, and it's just I don't know. The scene looks really good yeah. because like there's not like a lot of 
big character moments where you like the cast is good together and they have yep. good chemistry, but like that was one moment where I was like, oh, like you feel the connection between them, the characters in that moment when they're trying yeah. to save him. And I was like, I would have liked more of that, but then I, that might have been like a casualty of like cutscenes or anything like that too. Or you know, but it's a really well done sequence and just based on imagery, uh, because this is like this is always whenever I go on a website that's talking about this movie, one of the images they, they use is that headline image is that image of Sam Neill with his eyes like like pretty much gouged out. Uh yeah. and like and that still like looks so great and um Poor Jason Isaac, so he gets it rough <laughs> by the time he like by the yeah. time he catches up to him. That was another yeah. weird cut too, because like he, the sequence is pretty scary, right? He's like he's laying him down. They're gonna he's like about to cut him open and all that stuff, right? And then there's a yeah. cut to Lawrence Fishburne right away discovering where Jason Isaac is, and he's already hung up, peeled open. Yeah, and again, was very like, Hellraiser ask. <laughs> yeah, and the shot's cool, but I was like the way it was cut, I was like it really feels like. That had just started, and two seconds later, he found him there, and I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> I remember I said it out loud to myself. I was like, "That was fast," and like, and yeah. then, but, but you know, that is, I, yeah, some, can be some, too con- some about. content edited out for sure. Yeah, can be too nitpicky, but really cool, like image and stuff, and also scary to like watch uh, Sam Neill's at that point being possessed by you know, pretty much, and like by the time he gets to that point, he is pretty like freaky and a little bit frightening. Uh, so like, and he's you know strong too apparently. <laughs> on yeah. top of that, um, that's actually a great yeah. segue. Um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, finish your point. I'll save this. Oh no, no, it was that. That's what I was pretty much saying. Like once he once he gets to the point where he's fully possessed by you know this force mm-hmm. that's in the ship, uh, he it, it, he it just the way he looks and the way his stuff is delivered, like he's such an imposing like figure by that point. Yeah. And then you know, and then it kind of I guess it just trans like segues or goes always that scene where Lawrence Fishburne is seeing his greatest fear and then eventually before he like basically detonates the ship to sacrifice himself it turns into you know the resurrected form of weir again and like now he's all cut up and like that also feels that whole image of how he looks looks very like feels very hellraiser yeah. as well too um yes so yeah all, all that stuff is just really well done and well it's executed so probably this um, would be my favorite. I thought what you said was a great segue into a question that i had and i haven't really pondered it myself there very well might be like evidence for this in the movie but i want to get your take on it is do you think uh sam neil's character dr weir is like corrupted by the ship and like made to be evil like after they get there or do you think that he's got ill intentions from the beginning of the movie so the way i watched it and i wonder if this is like an open to interpretation thing i thought by the time he gets on the ship that it starts to slowly corrupt him and and because like there's certain scenes where it seems like he's not really manipulating them or doing anything like to be some kind of like you know underhanded like you know I have ulterior motives kind of thing, right? Uh, but he is, and I because I don't think he gets like weird in his motivations until they're on there for a while. So that's why I feel like it's like a slower kind of gradual uh, possession or corruption of his mind. Because um, mm. there are because there are some scenes where he's alone, like when he's in that like kind of like green like room thing, and he sees that image like. He sees his that image like one of his fears. He's right. in that position alone, and he seems like it's not. He's not doing anything nefarious, or like it. Right. It seems like it's like you know he has ship is own, fucking with him too. Him too. Yeah. yeah. So like I do wonder. I do. I I haven't looked up if anyone has other um ideas as to seems like a like great that. Reddit thread. If he's like that before he gets on there, and he's already evil by the time he gets in the ship. But that is interesting though. I did try to watch like how he is portrayed it, it seems like it's a, just a slow gradual like corruption of his mind but that's just my opinion but what do you think i don't know like i think it'll be something that i keep in mind next time i watch it and i'll probably like search the web for like some people's takes on what they think um but yeah i know i find it conflicting i think it comes down to maybe like like oversight in the editing and how they want to portray him because there's some dialogue that he has towards the end of the film when he is fully like possessed that makes me think that like he wouldn't be saying these things or acting this way if he wasn't trying to get our characters here from the start right but then you see like from the onset i think one of the first scenes in the movie certainly one of the first like scares is him envisioning his wife with the no eyes right. and like clearly the ship is like sending him like hallucinations and stuff um right. and we see him like in these moments where he's alone and vulnerable and the ship is like messing with his head 
but I feel like it, it's just like misdirection. Like I kind of lean towards the side that he was trying to get them there the whole time. And on that note, I found this like, I noticed this time more like a big parallel to this movie in Prometheus, you know, another movie in the alien yeah. franchise where there's a scene where they get out of cryo sleep and then Dr. Weir is kind of like explaining sort of how the ship works and what they're there to do. And it reminded me of Prometheus where you get this crew that agrees to get on this mission and they, that involves them going like into cryo sleep for a matter of months or years just to like really find out what the mission is. Once they wake up, it's like, you didn't know what you were getting into. Like, I can't, I find that so incredulous and it's kind of a right. cool parallel between those movies. It made me think of if Prometheus borrowed it or if it's just, I don't know. No, I, yeah. I understand what you're saying. I, it's cool that you like, when you watch it now that it, even if we don't know for sure, if Prometheus looked at that and like used it, just how much um, it could have influenced other movies like years later. Cause you know, uh, I don't people. Don't, I don't think they really think about that with like a Paul W. S. Anderson movie that came out in nineteen ninety seven. That was a flop. If it could have like influenced other movies, and then also the movies that this was influenced by as well, like are very yeah. clear. It's it's yeah. funny. This movie to me is a one of those middlemen movies where like you can clearly see its influences while watching it, and then I also can think of like other movies that I think borrowed cool little tidbits from this movie too like i know that we've talked about it a lot on this channel but we haven't watched it yet together is 2005's doom that oh, movie yeah. will remind you of event horizon quite really? a bit i think a lot of like the aesthetic and even some of the sequences in doom are ripped right out of this specifically because like just the long and short of it is like there's a again aliens too huge influence of doom but to make it but, quick that the main characters of that movie are like a, a space Marines that are going to uh, an outpost on Mars to like recover uh, a group of scientists that were like attacked by aliens. And there's a sequence where they like are playing, the rock is playing audio clip of all they have of for data on this terminal. And it's literally just like chaotic screaming and demonic noises, like very much like that scene in event horizon. Anyway, when we do watch that, I'm, I want to, I'm sure event horizon will creep up. And then yeah. Interstellar too, um, you know the whole wormhole sticking yeah. the pencil through the paper like that is like literally verbatim the same scene from Interstellar, yeah, which obviously yeah. came place. And then we even got Cooper from Interstellar. You know, there's a Cooper character in this movie too. I always wondered yeah. if that was like an intentional nod. But... His own little his own little nod to this. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool actually. Yeah, um, it's so funny. Uh, there's movies that like. I think about what I think about uh, when I think of you as, as far as being on the show, and yeah, because I know like it, it's uh, it's in Bruges because that was one of the first anniversary ones you did. You're like, I want, I yeah. want to do that movie. Doom is another one because that's been brought up on a few episodes uh, where times. you're like, where you're like, hey man, I know it's not it's not like high art or anything, but um, <laughs> it reminds me of a but I love it. That, you know, yeah, yeah, and like we have to cover that, and then of course Interstellar is another one too. Uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, that's that, I that would be a fun one to do because I know we talked about like. Because I have, like, I've seen pieces of it. But I've actually never like watched it all the way through, so that'd be a good one. That oh, I can't wait. I, it's we got to make it happen at some point. I just don't know when's the appropriate time to watch it. Like it's a, a space horror movie. Like you think oh, it came out two thousand five? In two thousand five? So oh yes, yeah, yeah, yes, it did. Maybe next year's the year. Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Anniversary coming up. Yep, for sure. Um, as far as the lost footage, um. If people are wondering uh, what might have been lost, um, they said that uh, known deleted scenes, including meeting between Weir and people in charge of the mission in which they discuss Event Horizon, some dialogue of which remain present in the theatrical trailer. Uh, there is, uh, they said, more backstory for Cooper and Justin, including a relationship between uh, Stark and Miller. Additional scenes explaining what the gateway to hell black hole is. Miller finding a tooth floating in uh, Event Horizon. A longer version of the scene where Peter hallucinates that her son's mangle legs are covered in maggots. I forgot about that too. Uh, mm, great scene. Rough scene. A scene where Weir hallucinates that Justin turns into his wife Claire. A bloodier version of Weir's wife Claire's suicide. A longer version of the scene where Miller finds DJ's uh, body with its cuts on the table. And a longer version of this. And a longer version of the visions from hell seen during Miller's final fight with Weir. And more shot, uh, more shots of of Event Horizon's crew being tortured. Um, Paul W.S. Anderson talked about the, uh, the scenes um, and where they might have gone. He said it was reduced unit footage, I think. The studio never bothered watching it because they thought it was inserts and buttons being pressed or something. But what it all was was actually all the hell footage influenced by Bosch and uh, 
other influences. So there was a beauty to it, even though it was very disturbing. He's like, he probably just thought it was B-roll and got rid of a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And like, and and that is crazy to me. Um, that is a lot, even though like to like read all that, if like if you because like those scenes have been easily like you know minutes that you could have like that add context to a lot of the stuff in the movie, especially yeah. because characters like Cooper and Justin, even though like the group is great together, they are a little bit more underwritten than the other characters too. So to know that there was some of the backstory left out for characters like that makes sense that like why why they might feel like underutilized, I guess, mm-hmm. in the movie. Um and apparently the bloody orgy video was longer too. Uh, as Anderson yes. sometimes as Anderson was sometimes too busy filming other scenes, second unit director, uh but in Gene filmed some parts of it. Real life amputees were used for special effects scenes where event horizon crew members were mutilated and pornographic film actors were hired to make the sex and rape scenes more realistic and graphic as well. Um yeah, I mean that's a lot. I mean I would have loved that's to see all that dedication. I can really uh, Yeah. Yeah, the fact that we don't we and we'll never we'll never be able to see it, but like it sounds hopefully, interesting. <laughs> hopefully one day, like I, I, is there any like speculation that the footage is like actually destroyed or it's just been like worn down over the years and it would be unsalvageable, or is it just a matter of like it was placed somewhere not logged correctly and it could be in any some warehouse somewhere? Any so idea? So like what? So like what this? Like I found this. It said an event a Horizon Q and A in 2011. Anderson was asked when extra footage would be made available. He said never. He said explaining that much of it was gone forever. However, in a 2012 interview, he announced that producer Loyal Levin had find had found a VHS tape, a VHS tape with his original rough cut. He said that after finishing Resident Evil Retribution, he planned to watch the recovered footage for the first time since assembling the film. But in a 2017 interview, he reiterated that a director's cut would never be released as the footage was no, that no longer existed. He he was asked about the VHS tape. He said neither he nor Levin had seen it yet, as Levin had moved to Spain. Uh, so like it seems like maybe he either he didn't see this VHS tape that he brought up in that uh, 2012 interview, or maybe that footage from that VHS tape just wasn't up to par and could be restored properly. Um, if there, I don't see how that if that producer or something who would find that VHS tape and that would be a lie. I you know, um, yeah. Hmm. So it might be an issue more of like it just didn't look good enough. Um, I would hope it'd be that. Like, like maybe you guys should revisit that again. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I have no idea, like, I'll be the first to admit, when it comes to, like, restorative technologies and, like, different mediums of film, I that's way over my head. I have no idea how that works. Like, that's magic as far as I'm concerned. But yeah. is it not possible with the technologies that we have now to, like, restore, like, VHS tape? And yeah. isn't that not what, like, restoration is, is, like, taking it yeah. from an older medium and, like, so if that did exist, like in theory, would that not be possible to like extract it and touch it up digitally? And yeah, I think that would be because like you know you get a lot of like you know, Arrow Video is another company that physical media company that does yeah. like stuff like special That's editions awesome and company. stuff. Uh, Shout Factory, Sweet Factory, they do the same thing too. And I think when they're finding older scenes, they've done that before where they've restored, you know, basically like VHS grade quality uh, video and restored them for like a new special edition release and cut them into the film or sometimes they'll cut them into the film sometimes maybe it's too low grade and they'll just add them on as a delete delete scenes to watch separately so you can see it um i wouldn't even mind that i guess if i it's like i guess better than not seeing the footage at all i mean even if they couldn't yeah like, throw it back i wouldn't mind throw it back in the movie like i would like you know i watch the scenes separately but I, it's possible but you know it, you know when it's a director like that he might be like hey you know i want the footage to look as good as it can and you know if it's gonna be thrown back into the movie, but yeah, I would love to see some of that stuff. Even reading it, it would have been interesting to kind of for all those stuff to add a bit more context to what the movie is, because like like I said, it's really well done. But you can tell when you're watching it that like it's it's very it feels like it's an accelerated pace at certain points, and not because like the tension's moving so fast. It just feels like oh, we're jumping from like one moment to one moment to one moment because exactly it's not around so much. Yeah. Oh yeah. Two more weeks and a few more minutes. Of footage to finesse this could be a it could literally it would raise the bar of this movie i think quite significantly and again i don't hold it against paul ws anderson more of a studio conflict and you know a really tight deadline that he had to work with but i think with what he was up against like you said earlier like he pulled off something still like quite good just with yeah. the potential to be so much more which is yeah. just kind of disappointing but i mean anyway, this movie is still very special i still enjoy it every time i watch it yeah and Event Horizon opened on August 15, 1997. 
Uh, it grossed only twenty six point six million in uh, domestic grosses and forty two million worldwide on a sixty million dollar budget. Thirty four percent on Rotten Tomatoes. A cinema score from opening day audiences gave it a D plus. So it's, it's in that rare little up. Uh, it's in, it's in, I think it's in there with Hereditary with the D plus. Um, uh, that still blows my mind to say that. that yeah. Was, I mean, it, it, I mean, I mean, it ended up doing well anyway. But I, I always blows my mind. Uh. Roger Ebert gave the film two out of four stars. He committed its atmosphere and noted the opening portion that's particularly well crafted. However, he felt it never managed to become the intense, thought provoking experience it wanted to be. Um, the Washington Post called it pointlessly loud <laughs> with more devotion to style than scares and satisfying explanation of its supernatural experiences. Empire said that the film never fulfills its promise, it is down to its over reliance on horror, uh, like typical horror cliches in a precision built sci fi milieu. Ultimately, it leaves too many unanswered questions, and that's because of a lot of cuts. And uh, that yeah. explains that. Um, I can't blame them for feeling that way, but yeah, yeah. It's reevaluation. Adrian noted its impact on other media, such as Dead Space, the Dead Space video games. I don't know anything about that because I don't play uh, video games. I know of them, perhaps. but yeah, in name only. They are really like uh, sci-fi horror video games. Yeah. Um, Total Film said it's been submitted in pop culture history as well as a cult classic and a vital addition to the sci-fi horror subgenre. Uh, Collider calls it grand, ambitious a vision that tries to marry many, many elements from the Alien films. It said the first half hour or so he was very closely to Aliens uh, with spiritual depth. Um, it doesn't quite pull it all together, but where the pieces do fit work better than expected. And uh, Fang- uh, Fangoria said that it's one of the best uh, sci-fi horror films the last 25 years. And then Variety named it in 2024 as the 94th best horror film of all time. Uh, any any <laughs> subject? Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think part of I mean, I I love for movies to get reassessed and reevaluated. I think it's cool. I I think it's I cool too. Don't know if it's one of the greatest horror anything ever made. I I don't know how what I would rank it or how I would define it. I I do like that it found life and it it definitely deserves a shot to be seen. Uh, and in a way that is respected in some way. Um, totally. I just don't like, I, you know, I would never put it in the same category as Alien as far as like, no, you know, it's classic being a classic on that level. Um, Definitely not. But still well done though. Exactly. Uh, there was going to be a television series in 2019 at one point, and Adam Wingard was going to direct it. What? Um, yeah. And March 2024. Like a re- re- yeah. Sorry, I'll let you read it out. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, and in March 2024, Wingard provided a brief update saying, it's definitely in the works. I've been, because he was busy doing Godzilla. He's like, I've been in Godzilla land for so long. I wouldn't say that there's definitive traction in terms of it moving forward, but we have a fucking amazing script. Once this, this movie's over, it's just about refocusing my attention towards getting that set up. That was in 2020, or uh, March of this year. So maybe wow. still happening. Um, I would take this this plot of Event Horizon. I would <laughs> like to see show? that reimagined. That would be really cool. It'd be a good uh, streaming series, I think. Uh, I think so too. And Adam Weingart's got his roots in horror too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, is there anything else that you want to bring up about um, the movie as far as uh, everything we touched, like praise wise, I think we hit. Like I said, I'm a little bit more critical on this movie after this watch, but like overall, it's an enjoyable experience. I will see it again at some point. I feel like, you know, three watches in three or four years is quite dense. Um, but yeah, I think we really hit a note on everything I had to say. One other thing maybe that kind of bugs me when it comes to sci-fi movies, uh, and this would be more of like a critique on like the writing and the script, not so much like the editing and the the studio involvement, but find there is a lot of science fiction mumbo jumbo bounce between the characters. You know, like when a movie like explaining these high concepts, whether they're fictional or, or non-fictional, like scientific jargon and yeah. And it just expects the audience to know what these things mean. No, that is mean. like, look, look at your friend no, next to you, like, yeah, yeah, you know what it is, right? Exactly. <laughs> like, uh, no. <laughs> when every character in the movie is from a scientific background, and there's not a character that's in there for somebody to use as exposition and explain these things, that makes right. it hard to relate a little bit. It kind of disillusions me sometimes, especially for movies of this period. So that's one thing that, like, I want to say that I would like put against this: the writing of this movie. Other than that, and like you said, some some out of place like dialogue. Like I always find it funny. Like Cooper's character when he has such, such random out of pocket comedic moments. Like it's kind of funny. Like looking back at it, but like it totally 
contrasts like the overall atmosphere of this movie, which is pretty, I'd say, grounded in horror. It doesn't usually and try to be anything else, but like pretty serious and like no it, levity exactly. for the most part, except for him, which makes it seem like kind of out of Cooper. place. I'm very um, I, it's like when he's shooting back to the to the event horizon from outside. Yeah. He goes, I'm back, motherfucker. I'm like, yeah, yeah. That sounds that is ripped from a completely different movie. Yeah, yeah. And part of my brain, and part of my brain is I was like, man, they made the black guy like the comic relief. I know, <laughs> which is like which happens a lot across that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It happens a lot in movies like that because I think he has that line early in the movie where uh, he's talking to one of the female characters. I think it's Julie Richardson's character, the blonde, and I think Stark, he it said, is. Ma- makes a comment about. Uh, wanting to, does she want to have like some black inside of her or something like that? It's a sex joke, and I was like, Oh, <laughs> jarring out of nowhere. And you're right, yeah, the sub towards the, the sub towards the end during the climax, and because the climax is so serious, like everything that's going on, like it's like this level of destruction, people are dying like back to back, and like yep. it's so serious that when he is, like you said, floating back, uh, and he hits the window, and he, yes, like, right before he hits the window, he has that line. I was like, That feels oddly out of like place. And that's not the only place where his dialogue is like unnecessarily comedic and it's all in the last act and it just comes from out of nowhere and it it doesn't fit. So like, anyway, harp on the movie anymore than it should be because it's, it's overall, it's a fun experience. And I will say, uh, we, I know we talk about how like too much exposition sometimes is like, Oh, that I, you don't like characters being that like, Oh, explaining what's going on. But I agree with you. If It's going to be something like this where there's a lot of like, scientific jargon have a one character be a translator for the audience about what you just said (laughs) exactly nice because like in a movie like this too right like it's not based on anything that we know so this is like something that they're kind of making up for the particular film that they're in so we don't have any Mm -hmm. prior knowledge of like what you're talking about and we're just like all right i'm i'll try to go with it i don't know what you're really saying but we'll make it work (laughs) exactly there's a little bit of it when weir's like explaining to the crew how the event horizon works like with its core and everything and that like i said like earlier the interstellar example where he explains how the wormhole works yeah that's about it like there's a lot of stuff that's thrown around the characters like and i'm like what the hell does that even mean that could be like uh gibberish in the scientific community and i would have no idea and there's no one really to dumb it down for so yeah anyway it is i did want to ask you Yep. Before we wrap up, because it came out in 97, like, what are your, because, you know, sometimes movies can look dated as far as effects and how they look. I did want to ask you, like, based on when it came out and we watching it today, like, how do you think the look of the film affects how they hold up? Uh, this is a good example, or a weird example, I should say, because, and I haven't really taken the time to decide percentages, but there's quite a bit of practical and, like, VFX yeah. in this movie. The practical stuff, of course, holds up really great. All the gore and all that, anything related to like the violence and gore of this movie seemed to have been done practically and holds up really, really well. And the CGI, I feel like it's less CGI than practical, but some of it has aged poorly. And I feel like, actually, well, I know a lot of the special effects budget was used very, it, it took up a lot of like very small scenes. So there right. wasn't as much left over. And I guess, of course, like, you know, the, the really tight budget would have contributed to that or tight uh, shooting timeline would have contributed to how the budget was spaced out. Um, but yeah. I think they did like even the, you know, there's some what I would consider by today's standards, like poor CGI of like the stuff that's floating in zero gravity. Like you can tell that's not practical, yeah. but I think for like, for the time, it still looks timely, not yeah. in that in a bad way. Like it just didn't, it doesn't look great by comparison to other like maybe early 2000s sci-fi movies but there's definitely worse in movies of the same category from later if that makes if you right. know what i'm saying like yeah. from 1997 the, the cgi is pretty decent for what they were working against but the practical stuff is fantastic still exactly. to this day I, like, you wouldn't even know and done really yeah. well but yeah, it, it, to put it lightly to sum it all up, it doesn't take me out of the experience of watching this movie like it does sometimes, but yeah. yeah. I would, um, I would I agree with that. You, okay. yeah, I was going to yeah. ask, like, because I know that you've seen probably a few, but like, where would you rank this in Paul W.S. Anderson's filmography? Because I think I've only seen four of his movies, or maybe three, um, and I think it's my favorite. I'm probably going to go with that. I just pulled up his, just so I, it's like, it probably is. I would. I think it's his best overall. Well, it like as far as uh, as a technical achievement and what he what he was able to achieve with it, based right. on like the issues that were going on with it, it's probably his best movie. Um, I mean, 
you have to understand, like liking like Mortal Kombat is not like, oh, that's a good movie. It's just it came no. out in '95. It was a big nostalgia fest. If you watch it now, so it's it's fun in that regard. I actually don't mind. Uh, the first Resident Evil is fine. Yeah, that's him. Like, he did a few of those movies, but he definitely yeah. did the first. Um, and I I think it, yeah, but again, I'm a much different critic of those because I didn't play the video games, so I'm watching it. Just Nor did I. Fun, like zombie kind of like horror movie, I guess, like action horror movie. Um, and didn't he do Alien vs. Predator? He did. I don't okay, know if so, he did the second one. I don't think he did, but he did the first one, which I also so, like love to hate sometimes. That's another one I gotta rewatch again because I've it's been a long time since I watched it. That um, was 20 years old this year. I don't yeah, know yeah, when yeah. it came out though, like what you might, uh, but yeah, yeah, August 12th, uh, 2004. So, oh, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's an easy pick to rank it as his top movie. I mean, yeah. I know some people love some of the Resident Evil movies he's done, but this, and he's not very known as being like a great filmmaker, you know, compared no. to other filmmakers. Um, I think this is the closest he gets to like doing something that not is not just something that's like popcorn, just like mindless entertainment. There are there are some good ideas in it, and uh, For sure, not fully realized because of how the production, you know, history of it, but. Right, he, I think easily his best movie. Prove that he could, you know, work under pressure and meet deadlines for <sighs> Paramount, though. Which, if nothing else, is like impressive that he was able to do that and make something watchable. Yeah, I agree. Agreed. Um, so, so as far as scoring, uh, what do you give? Uh, no reason. I don't know what I would have given this in my previous watches. I don't know if like my score, my rating is like diminished because I never had logged it anywhere, but. As of this rewatch, I've gotten out of three. And that's a good three. Like, I like this movie. I want to watch this movie again. I find a lot to take out of the experience. I love watching the influence, influences of this movie, whether it's Alien, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, really, I think, influences this movie, The Shining in a couple shots. Uh, yeah. And I also find it cool to see, like I said, it's kind of a middle ground movie where I can think I can see some influences on other sci-fi movies like Prometheus yeah. and Interstellar. I could be, you know, completely shooting in the dark here, but you know, there's some similarity. So I find that a lot of fun when I'm watching the movie. Uh and the performances specifically um Lawrence Fishburne and Sam Neill, though those guys are always great to watch yeah, and see really inspire good. and go at it together. A lot of fun. So yeah, lots yep. of great takeaways from this movie. But yeah, I'd say, you know, it's hard to deny the impact that you know, that shooting schedule and editing schedule had on this movie and some of the dialogue. So, you know, that's going to take away some points. So ultimately yeah. it's sitting at a three, but yeah. What about you? Well, well we've been on the same page with scores lately. So I, yes, we have been. I felt you uh, as well. Yeah. yeah. I'll give it three I as well. We'd be yeah. the same. And I agree uh, with you. It's a very good three. It's like, it's really well done. And I think I, I mentioned it earlier where I was like, you know, most movies that have this kind of production history where it's just like, you hear horror stories of like, didn't have nine shoot things ran out of money you know yeah you know, the editing process was too short all those kind of things and you see the final product and you're like oh i it looks like you guys stitched that together <laughs> in a very mm -hmm. poor way i mean uh it's the only one i can think of right now is like the last fantastic four with miles teller and michael b jordan that had a really troubled production and also right. and then i mean i will i'll never forget watching that movie where it felt like all builds up to like you know how they get their powers and all that stuff and then it cut and I thought I actually probably missed something, or like maybe I turned around too long. I've heard and, you like, describe it, this before. It, it, it felt like it jumped right to the climax, and I was like, I, I, I was like, where did like you could tell like a good chunk of that movie was gone? Right. And this doesn't feel like that. Like there are some scenes where it does feel like it gets a little jumpy, but I think for the most part, it still feels cohesive enough to be, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, entertaining in all the right spots. And like again, I think it, it has better ideas maybe than like the total execution, but still like. Really well exactly. done. Exactly. So I, I enjoyed it, and I agree with you about the actors. Laura Switchburg and Sam Neill. They're everyone. In the movie's good, but they, they those two are uh, very uh, always good to watch, and they have some really good stuff together. I mean, Sam Neill also scores again, good at playing evil by the end of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, really well done. Uh, glad you picked it. Thank it's you. Been while, Thank I, you for indulging me. Been like been a while since I watched it, so I was very I was impressed with it again. And then to, yeah, and I also agree with you about how it looks. I think it it holds up pretty well, especially with as far as practical effects. There's always going to be some clunky visual effects. I mean, it came out in '97. I mean, hey. just 
it, no way advances, a lot of advances made right since then right and uh and, and even though it's a six million dollar budget movie that's saying that's not really huge especially by most standards so i think it still looks as good as it can look because you really came out oh. so yeah mostly good nice. things to be said about event horizon and if you are on the fence about it, you should still check it out you'll probably totally. see like i said it's like people write about it a lot in the years as it's come out you know i don't i don't think it's a horror masterpiece by any means or anything like that but you know i'm glad it is cool that like considering what he went through making it it is cool that people have found it reevaluated it and given it life because it didn't really have any when it came out in 97 so there's i guess a positive side to people you know labeling it as such so totally I'll, I'll go with it i don't we don't have to agree with them but i'll go with it as well exactly so, yeah with so, nothing uh, else then yeah. take us away well, uh, this will be episode two ten. I have to like look at what the last back to blockbuster. Uh, and I know Jax is like, "Fuck!" I feel like we just did two hundred, but yeah, I really yeah. guys, we did like a, a several of these in a row, and they came out like every day uh, leading up to Halloween. Uh, and the set was two hundred nine, so this is two ten. Um, we are going to slow down a little bit uh, towards the uh, as the year winds down because uh, uh, we're still uh, dealing with Jax's schedule, which will be done pretty soon. Uh, the way yeah, it's been going. And uh, but we also I have to acknowledge uh, that uh, it's good to slow down <laughs> at a certain point. Um, we're going to make sure that episodes are out where there's not a break in the show, but we are going to give ourselves both of ourselves a proper break, probably like like we did last year. I think last year we had like two weeks where we didn't record, or maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, right at, at the had... at the end of the year, yeah, exactly. And, and leading into the new year, so we're going to give us uh, some of that time too, so we can come back uh, in the new year fully rejuvenated. And playlists already emailed me about like what our plans were for 2025. And I was like, I'm glad that you guys are interested and invested. And as soon as we get through the last couple months of this uh, year, I will let you know what our, plan, what our plans are. Totally. Uh, but thank you for nice uh, having us to carry. Yeah, yeah. Next year. That's amazing. Cause yes, we yeah, both yeah. are really excited for what 2025 will bring. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and as always, uh, you can listen to us wherever you get your podcast. It's Apple podcasts, Spotify, good pods, Anywhere is great. We also have the playlist to give up where you can find and listen to our show and other shows made by playlists because they are our podcast network. And as we said, they are pretty amazing uh, getting the show out, edited, and released on time. So make sure you check that out too. Um, for those of you who are discovering the YouTube channel, uh, I told Jackson earlier that some stuff on there is getting a lot of good traction and we jumped in a lot, a lot in subscribers uh, just yesterday. Uh, there will be more stuff on that very, very soon. But in the meantime, you can subscribe to us there. So like, at least you're ready for it. When we do release that stuff. Another uh, thing that'll be happening um, at the top of the year is that we're going to be really focusing on how to uh, present the audio show to you guys and also present a more visual show too. Cause I know some people like to listen. Some people like to watch while they listen. So we want to be able to accommodate uh, both of those things for you. So subscribe to us there where you can find us at back to the blockbuster um yeah we're gonna close out the year with uh some anniversaries a little news some christmas stuff um but yeah some simple stuff to get us out through the end of the year and of course a war season starts in that pretty much is around now uh but by the time jackson's done we'll be in the thick of that so uh we'll have a, a lot coming your way and we're really excited and like i said happy to close the year out very soon it's so weird it's november now like i feel like i feel like once we hit the summer it was I mean, I just everything just went Second by really year fast. always goes by faster yeah um but yeah that's all we got for you as always jackson thank you for uh giving the time during a very busy time of your life i appreciate it um Likewise, people like to hear you on, people like to hear you on the episode so i'm glad we have a, a good a, a like good amount of them. you on them yeah well yeah <laughs> i'm glad we have a good amount of you on them despite uh your schedule right now yes um but yeah and until next time i guess next time you will hear jackson I will probably be to talk about one of his favorite movies. So that'll be a, a fun one. Uh, and it'll be very timely because uh, everyone knows that you like Interstellar. We're going to cover that as, as an anniversary episode. Uh, Christopher Nolan's in the news now because he's prepping his next movie. So we'll be able to look back at something he did 10 years ago, see if it still holds up 10, zero, 10 years later. Spoiler alert, it probably does. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it'll be a fun one to uh, get into. And uh, yeah, I'll, next time you hear Jackson on uh, an episode of Back to the Blockbuster. And a few more before we close up the year. So yes. thank you, Jackson, for making the time. I know you're super busy, but I appreciate it. You don't got to thank me for nothing. Thank you for indulging mm -hmm. me in this late leftover Tales of Horror episode. It was great to chat. This 90s, I'd say, cult classic. And always a pleasure yep. just to be chatting with you, my friend. So, yeah, 
awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Hopefully you guys, if you haven't checked out Event Horizon, hopefully we've convinced you to do so. Totally recommend it. And, uh, you know, excited for this next watch. But very excited for the things to come and for the rest of the year. And cannot wait to chat Interstellar here in the next probably couple of weeks. So stay tuned for yeah. that episode, guys. Yeah, for sure. Until next time, guys. Peace. Take care.